the time have come to talk about the new Apple Silicon Mac Pro and we're going to be comparing this against a Mac Studio and see how the performance is and what are some of the benefits that you may gain from choosing a Mac Pro. I have a lot of thoughts on this, so let's find out. This is Art is Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. Thank you to those who have already subscribed. If you're new, please consider subscribing so that these videos would reach a larger audience. All the content on this channel are self-funded, particularly for these Mac testing videos. If you find information helpful, please consider supporting the channel. I'll leave a link to my tip jar in the description, or you can choose to use YouTube Super Thanks as well. All the funding would go in directly to running this channel and for future hardware purchases. As usual, I'll be sharing with you a lot of information and I highly encourage that you pause the video so you can analyze the result yourself in addition to the analysis I'll be sharing with you and there'll be timestamped to the various tests in the description so you can jump ahead if you choose. We're going to talk about the Pro Desktop Max and we are going to compare a few machines. So for this, we're going to look at the M2 Ultra on all of them and we're just looking at the M2 Ultra base SoC because spending the extra $1,000 to upgrade for an extra 12 core GPU it's not something that I really see a lot of benefit. And if you're not sure if your app is going to utilize the extra GPU power or not, chances are it won't. And the M2 Ultra Base SoC is going to offer the best value per performance that you can get because upgrading those SoC, you're not getting any more CPU and you're not getting any more on the system other than the GPU. So that would be my advice. Now, when we take a look at this, we're gonna take a look at two Mac Studio with M2 Ultra, one with 64 gigabytes of memory that is stock. This is upgrade to 128. And we are seeing a price delta from stock here of around $800 on this one. Now, when we take a look at the M2 Ultra Mac Studio, comparing this to the Mac Pro with the M2 Ultra, we're looking at a price delta of around 3 k so you may wonder what is the difference there. And Apple have also slightly bumped up the price compared to the Intel-based Mac Pro that have come in the past as well. Although they are giving us a little bit more, for example, more memory in the system, you are getting technically a much faster shift than the Intel one of the previous generation. So I do see the point why they are doing this. And I also have some thoughts about design and everything too that I'll share as we go along here. But we're gonna find out why this 3000K may be worth it and what discipline you may be working creatively that makes sense. For this, I'm also gonna add in result from other machine as well. Remember though that the M2 and also the M1 Max, I'm using previous testing result. So if there is any variation in the testing that may skew some of the previous values, I will let you know when it does come up. Otherwise, you know, the results are, you know, going to pan out the way how they are. I'm also including the M2 Pro, M2 Mac base, and also the M1 Ultra, which I will say that the M1 Ultra machine, considering that Apple is selling that refurb now, it is really a fantastic value compared to any of the current generation ones. And I'm still impressed by the performance of that. Now, when it comes to these machines, they are extremely expensive when we get to the Pro range and I can't buy every single configuration because obviously this is really getting into the financially impossible part. So these are majority of them are gonna be the base configuration. And as you start to bump up from there, you can really figure out where you may gain some of the benefit, for example, upgrading to 128 gigabyte memory on the system. With Apple Silicon, we have to remember that there are segmentations, meaning that there are more the consumer leaning and more the pro oriented. The one thing I like about testing all the pro oriented machine is that everything export that much faster and you're not just sitting there to wait. And that also applies to my pro workflow as well. I don't like to sit there and wait for the computer to finish something. I want it to finish fast so I can get on with my next task right away. And this is the reason why I have been using the Ultra for the past two generation and I love those SOC. Remember that I am going to be taking a pro photographer perspective, one that does a lot of raw files like in the thousands because I photograph weddings, events, I also do architecture. So I do a lot of photo work that does require me to process these out fastly. Everything is on a timely fashion, so or a time limit rather. So having a fast machine is definitely going to be important. The other thing too is that I'm testing all this based on a single app testing because I wanna see how the silicon is performing from one computer to the next, from one generation to the next, and from one silicon model to the next silicon model as well. Doing any type of multitasking will just pretty much be different from my multitasking to yours and that also adds in a lot of variable into the testing. Note that some of these are gonna be based on reference testing as I already said, majority of them are actually retest the results. And one of the things that I will always go back on with these machines is that there is definitely a lack of optimization, particularly when it comes to, for instance, with these newer OS and newer software, 
on the M1 Ultra I, Mac Studio, I've seen is clearly that these latest OS and also later software tends to export and render previews slower than the earlier version of the OS and the software themselves. So there's a lot of optimization issue happening. Thank goodness we are getting to top performance on these M2 Ultra generation, yet it's still slower in the current OS and the current software than the previous result from the M1 Ultra. So something to think about there. Regarding display and calibration, they work out a box for both Calibrite and also BenQ software, Palette Master Ultimate Works. So if you are a pro using BenQ SMU display, you can get good color on day one without any slowdown whatsoever. And that is crucial to get you going. So the question to really ask yourself then is to Mac Pro or not to Mac Pro? Because if you take a look at just the ports on the machine, going from the Ultra Studio to the Ultra Pro, what we're really getting is two extra Thunderbolt ports, dual HDMI, dual 10 gigabit ethernet. So if these are the things you're looking for and the things that you are needing in your workflow, it's definitely something to consider in addition to the internal expansion that you do not get with the Studio. So for instance, there is a USB-A that is internal to the machine that allows you to plug in a USB with a licensing stick so you can have it built in internally so that no one would take that license stick away from the machine and there's also two SATA header as well so you can plug in that and use it with for example an SSD that you want to link up internally to the machine they make caddies for it I think Sonnet definitely make one there are a few other companies as well or you can also choose to put spinning hard drives in there too and most importantly there are six full link PCIe Gen 4 two of them are 16 times four of them are eight time slot and there's also an extra power connector if you are using a card that needs more power on the system. So when we take a look at this, I mean, you can see the ports there on the side. I mean, Apple have definitely added in a lot of ports to the system. And for the most part, the system does look empty. So we really are looking at this and we're probably wondering how come Apple haven't really redesigned the machine as much? I mean, it makes sense if you take a look at the Mac Pro generation going from one generation SOC or from PowerPC to Intel for that matter, Apple have kept the chassis and everything the same with just minor changes to the internal. And I think we are seeing that here as well. Chances are it may be that in the next generation, Apple would make a slightly smaller Mac Pro where you don't need all these extra space anymore. But here's the thing. I mean, if you are using, for example, six full link car, you're going to populate all of this area all the way. And if you're adding in, for example, hard drive using these SATA connectors, you're going to populate this all the way. So there is ways to really fill this machine up. So that may be also the consideration as well for super pro workflow. This is something that still makes a lot of sense. Now inside these Mac Pro, there are two SATA headers, but I do have an anecdotal story about it. So before I got the 2019 Mac Pro, I saw the potential I'm going to add in drive. Once I got the machine, I decided against it because Adding in these drive would do a few things. It would add more weight to the machine, which is not a big deal, is already heavy. It would also draw more power, which I mean, the power supply can give, you know, power to the system without any problems. However, the big issue comes into the vibration, the noise and the heat generation, which also will cause the fan on the system to run at a higher RPM to cool down these drive as well. Now, some of you may say that, well, instead of using hard drive, I can always put in SSD and that's true. However, there are NVMe SSDs that are much faster. So this is going to be highly workflow dependent. So you may wonder who really needs this machine. I would say some photographers. If you're shooting at the very high end, you have an unlimited budget. You can have all these add-on cards for a super fast storage pool, and you can even have multiple cards backing up each other internally to the machine. This is the way to go. But falling short of that for most photographers, I say it in the Mac Studio, with the Max or with the Ultra SoC are definitely a better option. Now, when it comes to Video Pro, these are really created for video because you can go in and add all the add-on cards and it makes absolute perfect sense to go for a video workflow inside these machines. When it comes to music, this can be a questionable experience. And the reason why I say that is because for most music pros, especially if you're doing a large composition, you would load all those instruments into the memory and with the M2 generation, the M2 Ultra maxing out at 192 gigabyte, that can be a big limitation because in the previous generation Mac Pro, you can really install and expand that up to 
1.5 terabyte. So it really depends on the usage for music. It really is a mix right now. Maybe in an M3 generation, you can go in and use that. But I'll also leave a link to one YouTuber as well who is a music composer. His name is Neil Parfit. Uh, definitely check out his video. I really like his channel. It's really down to earth and he really gets to the point for music production. I'll leave a link to his video, like I said, in the description. So the main question here is this really worth $3,000 extra? Well, it really depends on what you need and what your workflow are and if you can really flex this extra $3,000 for a few of the dual HDMI, dual 10 gigabit Ethernet, two more Thunderbolt ports, and a whole lot of internal expandable storage. If this is something you're looking for, it might make sense. I also want to share with you as well, and I made a video on this, I'll leave links to these in the description. I have a Sonnet M.2 4x4. These are cards that host NVMe SSDs, and I have four of them running inside. I'm using Mac Software RAID, a two terabyte each to get an eight terabyte total storage. And with this, I have actually run a speed test on this. So with my current M1 Ultra and also M2, these are the read and write speed. When I am using an eGPU, this is done by Thunderbolt 3. So there's a lot of overhead on the system and that's the read and write speed I'm getting out of this PCIe card. When I plug this in to the Mac Pro on the 8X lane, I am getting almost more than double the speed. I mean, this is really fantastic. And when I plug it into the 16X, I mean, the speed is just pretty much out of this world. Now, based on this alone, what I, you know, decide to keep or just upgrade to the Mac Pro as my main machine, most likely not because getting these speed gain is great. But here's the thing. Most of the app that I'm using don't even go in and utilize the speed that are available with a Thunderbolt already. So really think about your workflow. Yes, having the super high speed is nice, but what is the utilization of that? And if you can totally go in and utilize it, I think it makes absolute perfect sense, but otherwise it may not. All right, so reading the specs on these machines, this is what it looks like. This is a little key legend, so we can take a look. And when it comes to internal SSD on these machines, one thing that I do notice was in the front for the 2019 Mac Pro, there are two slots that you can put in the SSD for an upgrade. On these machines, they have just put a plastic cover there. I think the SSD has been moved onto the backside of the SOC itself. And just remember that as of now, the internal SSD on these Mac Pro are still non-expandable and we should think of it as non-expandable. So get what you need right away. However, with the Mac Pro, you can always do an add-on card, add in hard drive or SSD. It's not really a problem at all. Here are the speeds on the machine comparing this with the M1 and M2 Ultra. They are performing just about the same. No big deal at all. Adding in a few of the other reference machine and you can start to see the spread there. So in general, the 512 are running slower than the one terabyte model. This makes absolutely perfect sense, but again, the 512 is still more than plenty for what we need. If you really wanna know how fast of an SSD you really need for a pro workflow, I'll leave a link to this video in the description. Simply put, anytime you have an SSD in your workflow, you're gonna be fine for photographers and also for most video workflow as well, except if you do the high end and do a lot of raw, may not be enough. All right. So when it comes to SSD, don't think so much about the speed of the SSD you're going to get. Think about the size that you're going to utilize today, tomorrow, and also how long you keep the machine because the longer you keep the machine, the more things pile up and you might want to get a larger SSD just for that reason. All right, when it comes to RAM of the system, it's finite. There are no more RAM slots on here. And when I open the backup, you only really just get like the back of the SOC. There is really no place to put in any RAM. So the way how you have configured it, it's going to be it. And there's no way to expand the RAM. You cannot plug in an extra card in the machine and expand the RAM. So just to be clear about that. So think about the RAM you need. If you're a pro, I always recommend this. Restart your machine. And when you do that, launch activity monitor, go to memory tab, check the memory pressure. If you're green, the current amount of memory you have is fine. If you're in the yellow or red, definitely consider upgrading more memory. If you're coming from the Intel generation machine, I would probably say leave the memory amount the same. Do not lower the amount of memory, even though these are Apple Silicon, leave it the same or go higher. That would be my advice to you. And if you want to keep track of the way how the system is running and the memory usage long-term, I personally use iStat Menu 6. I love it because it shows me the memory pressure. It shows me the actual memory usage and it keeps track of my history for 30 days. And this is uh, helpful metrics that I use all the time. When it comes to pro workflow, I recommend getting at least 32 gigabytes of memory because Lightroom can really go in and start to utilize 16 gigabytes of memory in pretty much no time at all. And now you're going to start to swap to the SSD. So having more memory definitely does help. And when it comes to these pro machines, it comes 64, so you don't need to have to worry about it much. And now let's take a look at the result from Lightroom Classic. All of these tests are running on Ventura 13.4. I've tested 12.3 and also 12.4. 
version of Lightroom Classic and the import and export time are identical. So when we take a look at the result for these 1000 Nikon D850 RAW file, these are the timing that I got. I also want to share with you as well as that even if you have 1000 Nikon DA50 file, the timing of your testing is going to be different from mine because what is in your picture is different than the control group images that I have. All right, with that in mind, the Mac Pro is just slightly slower than the Mac Studio. All of these machines that you're seeing right now are just literally between 10 and 15 seconds apart. I would say that majorities are still within a margin of error. And interestingly enough, bumping up the memory to 128 gigabytes on the M2 Ultra does not really bump up the performance at all when it comes to the one-to-one -one preview. Here's the result with the rest of the machine. And now let's take a look at export 1000 files. So, Mac Pro did pull ahead by a whopping three seconds, and this is comparing to the M2 Ultra with 128 gigabytes. It is around six seconds faster though than the M2 Ultra Studio with only 64 gigabytes of memory. And interestingly enough, if you look at all of these, I still think the M1 Ultra Studio and just the base configuration is still a really great contender because it's just really about 45, 48 seconds longer depending on the machine that you're looking at right now and this is really not big of a deal at all, but you save a lot of money and get a really star-studded performance on the Mac Studio M1 Ultra machine. Here's the result comparing with the rest in the lineup. You can see that there. Now let's take a look at Lightroom Classic HDR Merge. For this, the Mac Pro is pulling up ahead at 33 seconds, only one second apart. I attribute this to a margin of error how fast I can really react and press that start stop button on the timer. Otherwise, I think that all these HDR merge time are very similar to each other. Now let's take a look at Lightroom Classic Panorama Merge. This is taking 14 Nikon DA10 file and combining to create a 314 megapixel image. For this, timing are pretty much identical and also bumping this up to 128 gigabytes of memory on the system doesn't really improve the time as much one second apart all these are still within a margin of error and the mac pro i put it at the very top there because i mean it is the most expensive machine on this list now when it comes to panorama merge with these other machines you can see there that the moment you start to get out of the ultra territory time start to really increase and the m1 ultra is holding itself just fine against all these other machines and we're going to take a look at Lightroom Classic AI Noise Reduction. Many of you have been asking about this. This is a GPU-based task. So what Adobe have done is create an AI model that runs on the GPU. I genuinely wish that Adobe would code this so that it would really go in and utilize the uh, ML core or the NPU, that is the machine learning or the neural processing engine that are on these Apple Silicon. But however, that hasn't happened yet, at least in this version anyway. And timing between all those, you can see that any of the ultra machine is performing fairly well. Essentially, when you really look at this, this is just pretty much a GPU based performance. So the more GPU you have, the faster it is and the less GPU you have, the longer it takes. That is as simple as that right now, what you're seeing on this chart. Now let's take a look at Lightroom Desktop. This is version 6.3.1 and also 6.4. Performance between these two versions, again, super identical. So with this in mind, time spread as we would have expected. Slightly slower on the M1 Ultra, but only just by, I would probably say like 20, 25 seconds, not that big of a deal at all. The spread between all these machines are super identical. And interestingly enough, the M2 Ultra Studio is one second faster than the Pro, and I put these in the wrong position, but we're just gonna leave it there. But you start to get the idea, and the 128 is faster by around like three seconds. I don't think that's a big of a deal at all. Here's the result with the rest of the program. And as I mentioned in my initial video with the M2 Ultra, M2 Max, Max Studio video, there are a lot of weird results that are happening with the M1 Ultra on Lightroom Classic, on Lightroom. It doesn't go in and utilize all the core fully and everything. Um, the current operating system and current Lightroom version exports slower. All these things are happening. I'll leave a link to that video in the description. Now let's take a look at Capture 123. This is version 16.2.13. And the timing for the spread, are just similar. So realistically, this is how you look at Capture One. I don't think the Ultra is definitely the machine to use Capture One in at all, unless you're going to use Adobe product as well. And if you're just using Capture One, I would say just go with the Max SoC because it makes absolutely no sense to spend these extra money and only get these performance variation that are not that much at all. Between all these 20, 24 GPU core, there are some time improvement. But if you really think about this, for example, the M1 Ultra refurb compared to this machine right here, you're taking a look at close to $1,000 price variation 
for literally less than a minute time improvement. I don't think that is a good investment. And yes, the Mac Pro did come in on top, but what, at seven seconds faster than the 128 gigabyte model and at, you know, close to like less than a minute still faster than the 64 gigabyte one. So some things to think about there. Here's the result comparing this with the rest of the machine. And like I said, if you go with, for instance, the M2 Max, that tends to perform the best on this test with just the base amount of GPU. This is the base M2 Max with just the minimum of GPU in the Max, and it's still beating out all the Ultra machines in the list right now. So some interesting results there, and you save a lot of money that way. When it comes to export, these are the timing that we see right now. And I would say that the M1 Ultra Max Studio offers probably one of the best value per price point in this group of machines. The Mac Pro does pull in ahead of all the other machines with the 128 just slightly behind and also then the 64 gigabyte M2 Ultra. But what you're really seeing right now is between the Mac Pro and the Mac Studio, the performance delta is really small at best. I don't think this is offering any performance improvement in any way at all. This is the spread between all the other machines and we're now going to jump in and take a look at Photoshop. I'm using Lloyd Chamber Digital Lloyd Test. I'll leave a link to his website in the description. These are the three tests that I'm running and let's see where the improvement may come in. So for this one, I have listed the Mac Pro at the very bottom there. The spread is very similar to the M1 Ultra of the previous one. And pretty much the timing for all of these are very similar to each other. With, for example, the M2 Max running slightly longer. And even though that may look drastic, that's really just about like a fraction of a second longer. It's just that when everything is running low, any type of that exaggeration, you start to see a little bit more. Now let's take a look at Photoshop Media. Mind you, that majority of you would not be editing a Photoshop file that is 15.7 gigabytes. Now, some of you may, but most of you will not do this. And when we take a look at the timing there, we can see there are some like reference results. For example, the M2 is running a little bit strange, but we're not gonna worry about that. However, when it comes to the Mac Pro M2, comparing to, for instance, the Mac Studio M2 Ultra, timing are just pretty much about the same to each other. When it comes to Photoshop Huge, this is where we start to see some variation. Think about this for just a second. This is an extreme case scenario, a 56 gigabyte file. Most of us definitely would not do this. And even if we do it, it may be every once in a while. And I know there are some that do have Photoshop files that expand this large. So if you are these individual, this is definitely the key for you. Going in and upgrading to 128 gigabytes of memory will save you almost one third of a time compared to 64 gigabytes of memory. Otherwise, the performance spread are pretty much within a margin of error of each other with the Mac Pro coming in last at close to two seconds longer. Not big of a deal at all. And here's the performance against the rest of the machine, as you can see there. Now let's talk about the encoder decoder engine. So with this, we are taking a look at predominantly the Max compared to the Ultra, where the Ultra just pretty much goes in and double all of the engines that are in the Max alone. And let's take a look at the performance. So Max Studio with 128 gigabytes, the M2 Ultra is pulling slightly ahead by around six seconds faster. I would still attribute this to within a margin of error. Mac Pro, Mac Studio are performing just pretty much the same between these two. And the M1 Ultra, even though it is slightly longer, still really a great performer and a great contender. If, especially if you really calculate per price point, how much you're really getting, right? Here's the result for the rest of the H.264. HEVC 8-bit. So for this, the Mac Pro and the Mac Studio with 64 gigabytes are performing one second apart. This is within the margin of error. 128 gigabytes of memory does not really make it any faster at all. In fact, it's around three seconds slower than relative machine that is just right next up to it, the M2 Ultra with 64 gigabytes of memory. And this is the result from the M1 Ultra. Takes longer, but still a great contender. Here's the result for the rest of the machine and moving on to ProRes 422. Performance is just about the same with the M1 Ultra landing exactly where we would expect it. Now let's take a look at After Effect. Many of you have been asking this. I'm using Adobe Benchmark. Links to these tests will be in the description so you can run your own as well. And with this, we are taking a look at the 128 gigabyte machine running 
the best on this one and it's four seconds faster than the next one down which is the Mac Pro. So this is telling us that the Mac Pro performance is exactly the same as the Mac Studio. The main question then you really have to ask yourself is do you need the internal expansion on the machine because having the extra fan on the machine that may cool down the system a little bit better does not necessarily make the M2 Ultra run any faster compared to a Mac Studio. So these are things to really think about. What you do get with the extra $3,000 is that on the Mac Pro, Apple have included the mouse and also keyboard with the Touch ID as standard. So if the internal storage and also having those accessories is important to you, that would be the way to go. But I jokingly say that if you need the internal storage, Mac Pro is definitely the way to go. But at the price delta of performance wise and $3,000 more, I think I'm actually going to be much happier with the Mac Studio and I would say that for most photographers as well. So for upgraders, really think about what you need. If you have been running constrained for a while, if you're looking to come from the Intel Mac Pro generation, I would say that this makes a lot of sense because any machine or any Apple Silicon that you choose is going to perform better or really close to what the Intel Xenon can do before. It's always going to be an improvement. but if the creative industry that you're in can't really go in and utilize all this yet, or if it doesn't really meet the expectation that you have, for example, in music production, this may not necessarily be the machine for you yet. When it comes to photographers, like I said, I think Mac Studio is the best value, either with the Max or the Ultra. However, if you do video, you have a lot of add-on card. The Pro is definitely a good contender. As usual, I recommend if you're coming from an Intel machine, try as best as possible to keep the equivalent amount of memory unless you have an exorbitantly huge amount of memory that you may not need as much, then that's okay to downgrade a little bit. But if you're coming from like 32 gigabytes of memory, I would definitely still keep 32 or maybe go up to 64. Those would be my advice there. Reduction is something that you have to be careful. When it comes to upgrade or really think about where you wanna upgrade, if you have the Ultra right now, or if you have the Mac Studio already, I think there's not a lot of reasons to upgrade this cycle, unless you want to have the fastest, the latest and greatest machine, or if you're going from the Mac to the Ultra, this makes a lot of sense. But in general, I would still tell you to save the money by going from the M1 Max to, for example, the M1 Ultra, and that's going to still save you a lot of money and bring up a lot of performance in the machine. And it will be a much better upgrade path than getting, for example, the M2 Max. I created this chart for an upgrade path. Simply enough, the way how you use this is circle the silicon that you're on and look at the arrows where you may want to upgrade. I mean, we're talking about high-end machine here, but I'll use a classic example that you may not think about. For example, if you have an M2, going to the M1 Max or the M1 Ultra is not a bad option because it's still going to bump up the performance by quite a bit. So those are things to think about. It's really not all loss and you don't have to upgrade linearly within the same generation as well. If you have the M2 Max laptop, Top, going between these two ultra is going to give you the top performance possible on these computers. And lastly, if you're considering these two machines right now, the Mac Studio versus the Mac Pro, as I mentioned before, you're looking at a 3K price delta. And I would say that for majority of Creative Pros, the Mac Studio are going to work just fine. And it is a really nice compact machine and much easier and much lighter to lift than the Mac Pro. Now with this in mind, if you're looking at this current generation, I would also point you to Apple Refurb site because even just the base configuration M1 Ultra, it's still close to $1,000 cheaper than the M2 Ultra. And this machine, as you have seen so far, has performed extremely well against the current generation machine. Now, based on your creative discipline, I have created this chart so that you can best pick the silicon you want to use. This goes from good to best. And as you can see right now, the spread just kind of goes down. Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, any of these silicon would do. Top performance one are going to be the Ultra. When it comes to Photoshop, there's really no need for the Ultra, but I would just say get more RAM on the system because Photoshop can easily go in and utilize that. When it comes to Capture One, I recommend the Max because that gives you the best performance, but don't upgrade the SOC to the top one. Just use the base SOC with just the minimum of GPU on the Max. That's going to do fine. And when it comes to, for example, video, if you want to have the fastest encoding, decoding time, ProRes, I would go with the M2 Ultra. But falling short of that, I think the M1 is still a really great contender machine, especially if you are using, for instance, After Effects or any other app that goes in and utilize a lot of CPU in the system because the Ultra still has double the amount of CPU compared to the Max SoC. 
When it comes to RAM, all these machines that are the Super Pro one starts at 64. So, I mean, the only thing you really need to ask yourself at this point is, do you need more than 64 like me when I upgrade to 128 gigabytes? But if you're okay with 64, I think that these are gonna be amazing performing machine. When it comes to SSD, these are already configured with one terabyte. So not a lot to worry there, but if you want to add more internal storage, you can do that as well. And you also get slider faster speed as well. And as I usually say in NDs, there are really no one size fit all for any given budget. You really need to think about your creative workflow, your creative tasks, and what your needs are. For instance, if you're a photographer, you think you may do any type of video work in the future, any Apple Silicon would do the job just fine, especially if you choose the Pro one. It's just that if you choose the Ultra, it'll be a little bit faster, but here's the thing. You're not really gonna miss much if you're only just doing like video, even if you choose the Pro. But if you are, someone who needs a lot of internal expansion, adding in all those extra cards, I think that the Mac Pro is definitely a great contender for that. And it is a step in the right direction. Although, again, I mean, if you're doing music production workflow, the top memory at 192 may be a big limitation factor for you. So it really just all depends. And I still think that even though the transition for Apple Silicon is complete, we are still in that gray area where the M3 is going to bring the next improvement over and that may bring more creative industry over to Apple Silicon. But with that in mind, if you have any questions or comment, leave them below, give this a like, subscribe and hit on the bell renew and in art we trust.